So people have commented about my beard. Um, and I had a beard in the 70s and early 80s and shaved it off. And uh, over the Christmas holidays, I was out of the office for a while. My wife said, why don't you try and regrow that beard? And we joked that I might be a candidate to play Santa Claus next year. Uh, of course, I'd need to fatten up a bit. <laughs> so we're giving it a shot. It's an experiment. Uh, we'll see if we like it or not. So don't be surprised if a video in the next couple of weeks shows me clean shaven or not. I don't know whether we'll keep it or not, but it's been a fun experiment. Um, when I was on hormonal therapy for prostate cancer, I, I couldn't grow a beard. So uh, uh, this is a testament to uh, prostate cancer management that's worked. Uh, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is to update you on uh, oligometastatic disease. This is a concept that there are patients who have metastatic prostate cancer, but the cancer is effectively limited to the few spots that are present. And that if those existing disease sites are treated with radiation or surgery, that the patient can be made disease-free for a period of time that is yet to be fully defined. Uh, this is a direct challenge to the conventional wisdom in medical oncology uh, that once the cancer leaves the gland, it's everywhere. Uh, and, and so the, the, the reason medical oncologists think that is there's some excellent studies that show that uh, you can pick up prostate cancer cells in the blood and bone marrow of these patients. Uh, but that picking up a cancer cell in your bone marrow doesn't mean it can grow. And so the implication of the oligometastatic hypothesis uh, is that while cancer cells get to your bone marrow, uh, it's only a small proportion uh, with uh, specific mutations that can grow. And, of course, this is in a very controversial area right now with uh, genuine experts in the field uh, differing radically uh, in how they view this area. Um, um, the original paper on oligometastatic disease came out in 2003 for prostate cancer. And by 2004, I was trying it uh, on patients. And uh, so I have a growing group of patients who had metastatic disease and it was treated and years are passing and the cancer has not come back or when it did come back it was much slower growing, much less aggressive and easy to control. Uh, so what do we know now? Well, we know in fact there are patients who have oligometastatic disease uh, and that surgery or radiation therapy to the metastatic disease can make patients disease-free for a while that can span years or it can get rid of the aggressive clones uh, and leave you with a more indolent disease that's easier to control. Uh, in, but the real challenge is how do you identify this? Uh, and that's the major problem in the field is we really don't have great guidelines and those will only emerge uh, as the randomized controlled trials of oligometastatic disease uh, mature. So at present, I just have my clinical experience and so recognize that that is not as solid by any means as the guidelines that will subsequently emerge from randomized controlled trials. So patients with oligometastatic disease uh, can fit into several groups. There are those that have lymph node only recurrent disease, but it's limited to uh, one lymph node or one lymph node cluster or a few. Uh, the other are patients who have bone lesions and those that have both. So for bone lesions, uh, the cutoff appears to be five bone lesions. If you have more than five bone lesions, your odds of benefiting from oligometastatic directed therapy is, is dramatically lower. Uh, my experience is the, num the number for a real solid chance of benefit is lower than that. Um, over time I've also observed 
uh, that in addition to the number of metastases, uh, the rate at which the cancer grows is important. Uh, so oligometastatic disease is relatively uncommon uh, if the PSA doubling time is faster than three months. There might be an occasional patient, uh, but the risk of treatment may far outweigh the benefit. Uh, it's better if the doubling time is longer than, PSA doubling time is longer than six months, even better if it's longer than nine or 12 months. Uh, in fact, if the doubling time is longer than 12 months, the odds of successful treatment seem to go up fairly dramatically. Uh, so with lymph node disease, uh, the, the pattern is relatively similar. Uh, a cluster of nodes in the pelvis along the iliac or albureter arteries as the only site of disease uh, represent the patients with lymph node disease most likely to benefit. If both sides of the pelvis are involved, the success rate drops. Uh, if there's involvement at the back of the abdomen, we call that the retroperitoneum. Uh, the number of patients I've seen controlled with radiation uh, or, or surgery drops very dramatically. Uh, my biggest experience with radiation therapy, uh, and at least with IMRT, uh, the harm done by the radiating retroperitoneal lymph nodes uh, far exceeds any benefit, and I no longer recommend it. In particular, what I'm seeing is very severe damage to the immune system. Uh, the arm of the immune system that appears to be most sensitive are the CD4 cells. These are T cells that play a key role in cancer Im immunology. Um, the CD4 cells are also uh, key in viral infectious diseases. Uh, for example, in AIDS, an HIV infection becomes AIDS when the CD4 count goes under 200. And I've seen people post retroperitoneal lymph node radiation with CD4 counts in the 50 range. Uh, and we've had several of these patients get infectious complications, uh, bird tuberculosis, M. avium, uh, fungal infections, uh, severe recurrent shingles. Uh, so uh, I am very leery to send patients with retroperitoneal lymph node uh, involvement uh, for radiation. It's also a tricky area uh, for surgical removal too because these lymph nodes are right along the major blood vessels supplying the lower extremity, the vena cava and the aorta. Uh, and if they're nicked during surgery, you, you could easily bleed to death. Uh, although my experience with surgery is less extensive uh, than with radiation, I don't think it would have the immune deficit problem. So in this case, the skill of the surgeon uh, plays a, a key role. Uh, and I'm must say that I've been very impressed with Jeffrey Carnes at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, so if you're contemplating surgical removal, uh, I certainly can recommend Jeffrey Carnes uh, as a very skilled, careful surgeon who doesn't operate uh, when he thinks the risk is high. Um, but again, with lymph node involvement, the patients with a rapid PSA doubling time uh, or any of those standard indications of aggression are also not likely to benefit. Uh, the cancers that grow fast are likely also uh, widespread, uh, and you get rid of those diseases and, and those known sites and sites elsewhere uh, crop up. Uh, also undefined, uh, you know, with regular radiation therapy, for example, adjuvant hormonal therapy can dramatically improve the results. So. We have a bunch of new hormonal therapy drugs we've talked about. There's Firmagon, which I believe is an important advance uh, over Lupron and related drugs. We've got Extandi and Zytega, uh, another example. Uh, and what would happen with aggressive uh, use of systemic therapy uh, with Extandi or Zytega 
uh, and oligometastatic disease is also an unanswered question uh, given the tremendous value these new drugs pose for metastatic disease uh, I would put a high priority on, on assessing those in clinical trials. Uh, finally we know that uh, early use of taxotere uh, in patients with widespread metastatic disease uh, transforms their prognosis. Uh, and so an additional question uh, is could more patients be made uh, to have successful treatment of oligometastatic disease if adjuvant taxotere would be given along with it? Um, of course, there are technical problems with taxotere. Uh, doing surgery, uh, some patients get a low platelet count and are likely to bleed, and so that's an issue. Uh, and texotere does make normal tissues more sensitive to radiation injury, so the radiation would have to be done with greater care. Uh, the final question is, um, most of my experience has been with IMRT, but what about more focused forms of radiation therapy? Uh, tomotherapy, uh, cybernine, uh, for example. What about proton beam? Uh, again, my experience isn't broad, uh, but I have had patients with retinoperitoneal lymph node disease treated with proton beam with virtually no side effects. Uh, uh, so I, I do think it's possible that these more focused forms of radiation therapy may reduce the risk of what I regard as unacceptable uh, complications of treating retroperitoneal lymph node disease. Again, I hope that helps you. I would just want to stress this is an evolving area and this is uh, just to give you my current sense of the field. Uh, the real revolution will come when we get the randomized control results. Thank you.